Hello everyone and welcome to this online session that is part of the ARC 5016 study unit Geographic Information System for Archaeologists. This session will be focusing on some, on some more advanced aspects of the use of GIS for archaeology. In particular, by the end of this session, you will be able to recognize the difference between describing and testing a special pattern, to apply a formal statistical hypothesis test, and to explain, from a statistical point of view, the outcome of a hypothesis test. As you may remember from previous lectures, we can discover patterns in spatial data by using descriptive measures of spatial distribution, such as the mean center and the standard deviational ellipses. By doing so, we may find out that there could be a pattern of association between, for instance, the archaeological sites we are interested in and some natural features like water streams. After we locate a special pattern, we have to always bear in mind that the pattern we discover could have arisen just by chance. In front of any pattern that we may bring to the fore using the scripted statistics, it is crucial to formally verify how likely is that our pattern is the result of chance alone. We may be faced with different types of special pattern. This slide lists some of them. For instance, if we think about archaeological sites dispersion over a given area, sites can be randomly distributed, clustered, dispersed, or located close to natural features or to other sites. Once we locate and test for the existence of a special pattern, we have to make sense of the identified pattern in meaningful archaeological or anthropological terms. For instance, if sites are randomly distributed, this may indicate that they show no particular preference for any natural resource or that they do not interact or compete with one another. If sites are clustered, they may have formed groups because they were sharing some natural resources or because they were exploiting a specific part of the landscape. Other special patterns and their possible substantive interpretation are listed in, in the present slide. To test for a special pattern, we have to engage with what is called hypothesis testing. According to the logic of hypothesis testing, if we want to ascertain, for instance, if there is a special association between sun sites and water streams, we have to find a way, a formal way, to calculate the probability of observing the pattern we see in our data if there were no association between sites and streams. The hypothesis of no association against which we set our observed pattern is called null hypothesis. According to the logic of hypothesis testing, the pattern we observe must be set against the benchmark represented by the null hypothesis. Given the null hypothesis, we may want to test how likely the observed pattern would be if the null hypothesis were true. To put this into practice, we have to find a measure that quantifies the property of the pattern we observe, and we also need to calculate how many times we would observe a quantity equal or more extreme than the observed one if the null hypothesis were true. Let's assume that we want to test if some archaeological sites are associated with water streams. To quantify the property we are interested in, 
that is being close to water streams, we calculate the minimum distance of each side to the nearest water stream and then we average all these distances to come up with a single measure. Once we arrive at that measure, we may want to work out the distribution of the same measure, but this time generated under the null hypothesis of no association between sides and streams. In this slide, you can see a fictional group of five sides representing our observed pattern. The table to the right lists the distance of each site to the nearest water stream as well as the average of those five distances. The average of the observed minimum distances distills down into a single measure the spatial relationship between sites and streams. The next step is to understand how that measure would vary under the null hypothesis of no association between sites and streams and to understand how typical or conversely how extreme it would be under the null hypothesis. We can achieve that via a randomized approach whose first three iterations are summarized in this slide. Using a computer facility, we draw five random locations within the same area of our observed pattern. For each random location, we calculate its distance to the nearest stream, and then we average those distances, eventually coming up with an average. We repeat the procedure n times, for instance 999 times, eventually getting 999 averages of randomized minimum distances. The distribution of our 1000 averages represent the null hypothesis. Those are the average minimum distances that we would observe under the null hypothesis of no association between streams and between sides and water streams. To understand how typical or conversely, how extreme the observed measure would be under the null hypothesis, we set the observed average against the obtained distribution. A value in the main body of the distribution would be considered typical and could have arisen just by chance. If the observed measure falls in either tail of the distribution, it will be rarely observed if the null hypothesis were true. Using the data obtained so far, we can work out a probability value called p-value that formally quantifies how likely would our observed measure be if the null hypothesis were true. We well, our computer facility, first count how many times a measure equal or more extreme than the observed one occurs in the distribution, and then divide that count by the total number of measures. If the p-value is smaller than an established threshold, typically 5%, we can reject the null hypothesis of no association between sites and streams. Besides the p-value, we may want to focus on which tail of the distribution our observed measure falls in. If it falls in the upper tail, it indicates that our measure is larger than the majority of the average distances generated under the null hypothesis. This indicates a significant tendency of our sites to be more distant from the water streams than expected under the null hypothesis. On the other hand, if the observed measure falls in the lower tail of the distribution, it indicates that our measure is smaller than the majority of the average distances generated under the null hypothesis. This indicates a significant tendency of our sites to be closer to the water streams than expected under the null hypothesis.
Now that you have a grasp of the underlying logic of a hypothesis testing, I will show you how we can carry out a formal spatial test using RStudio. We will be using a specific function out of the GMA MISH package, which must be first downloaded from the official repository of R packages and then loaded in, into R. The latter step can be easily taken by either typing the command library open round parenthesis gma mish close round parenthesis or clicking the package in the list of packages displayed in the RStudios package panel. A complete list of the functions implemented in, in the gma mish package can be accessed by simply clicking on the package name which allows you to enter the package help documentation. The function that we are going to use is named this run sign, which stands for distance rank domains significance. We will be using that function to test if some fictional archaeological sites in Malta are located close to fictional water streams. In order for the function to work, we have to feed some data into the function itself. In our terminology, those data are called parameters. The first parameter is a point vector layer representing site's location. The second parameter is a polyline vector layer representing water streams. The third parameter is a polygon vector layer representing the study area, Malta in this case. The function generates an image displaying the frequency distribution histogram of the randomized average minimum distances. It also shows the average of the randomized minimum distances as well as the observed average minimum distance. Also, three p-values are reported. One for the hypothesis of sites closer to water streams than expected. One for the hypothesis of sites more distant from water streams than expected, and one for the hypothesis of a pattern different from random. How can we interpret the test result? The average of the observed minimum distances is smaller than the average of the randomized minimum distances. This indicates that the observed sites tend to be closer to water streams than randomly generated locations. Would this pattern be unusual if the null hypothesis were true? Since the observed average minimum distance falls in the lower tail of the distribution, the answer is yes, it will be unusual. The p-value indicates that that will be observed less than one time out of 1,000. This slide summarizes the key concept covered during this session. We should use descriptive statistics, like for example the mean center and standard deviational ellipses, to bring to the fore and describe special patterns. Any pattern that we identify must be tested in a formal way via hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing enables us to formally verify how unlikely or likely would be the observer pattern under the null hypothesis. We can use randomized approach to work out a probability value which is called p-value. A p-value smaller than a typical threshold, usually 5%, indicates that the pattern that we observe would be unusual if the chance alone were producing the observed pattern. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, you can drop me an email gianmarco.alberti at um.edu.mt Thank you.